Okay, let's uh, wait a minute for other students to join and then we'll begin the review. I'm sorry, what? Well, I guess that was just somebody had the speaker on. <clears throat> All right, um, are there any questions? I'm just looking over the exam questions before I begin the review, so give me a minute here. I just want to make sure I give you an appropriate review. Okay, if there's no questions, we're going to have only a review today. Now, let me start sharing the screen, although I should shut down some things before I... Uh, share the screen. So just a minute here. And I should start opening. Oops, our lessons. Which I've already got here. All right. Okay. If there's no questions, let's begin. As soon as I figure out where I am. I don't think we'll have a movie, but let's go ahead and put the sound on. All right. So if we look at the schedule of classes, we covered a lot. Uh, on the final, chapters three, four, five, and six, will be covered, but there will only be one question for chapters three, four, five, and six. And the lab will be covered as well, but generally speaking, in the labs, each lab will have at most one question from them. Are there any questions about that? Uh, the exception might be the lab safety might have two questions, but uh, um, I'll go ahead and highlight that one. So the ones that are in orange means that you will get at least two questions from. And with lab safety, I'm pretty sure it's not more than two. And with chapter eight, it's going to be no more than two or three. And I just feel that these chapters are a little bit easier, and so I'm not going to ask lots of questions on them. However, chapter one, which actually is an easy chapter, but uh, I'm going to ask a number of questions on those because that's where you're learning the history of biology. And so we talked about a lot of people that we'll then talk about later. And in chapter one, we briefly inter introduced, I don't have my right glasses on, we briefly introduced the uh, um, Cox postulates. We briefly in introduced endospores. Uh, we briefly introduced uh, lipid A as an endotoxin. But then we then went on in a later chapter to talk about those things. So chapter one will have probably greater than three questions, but uh, like when I'm talking about Louis Pasteur, he was introduced in chapter one, but we then ran into him later in, in, the, in the semester. Are there any questions about any of that? Uh, wait a minute. You know, I don't think I'm recording this. Let me stop the share and see if I'm recording this. You're recording. I am good. <laughs> I was 
need to make this available for everyone, and so I wanted to make sure I was recording it. All right, so chapter one and chapter eight and chapter 13, is that what that is? I'm going to have to wear these glasses because we can't read it without the glasses. Chapter 14, chapter... Ah, where's my scroller? Come on. Chapter uh, 14, Chapter 7, Antibiotics, Host Defenses 1, Host Defenses 2, Host Defenses 3. Yeah, I do definitely have some questions about vaccines in the final. Uh, and then Parasites. There will be at least two questions. For most of these chapters, there will be three questions on the final. So, does anyone want that list again? So How many questions total are there? I'm sorry? How many total questions are there? Slightly over 50. Okay. It'll be less than, there will, yeah, I haven't made the exam yet, so I haven't finalized it, but there will be less than 60, but over 50. And how well, long do we get? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, uh, let's see, if there's 60 questions, you will get at least 60 minutes plus, oh, let's say 10 or 15 minutes extra. Now, there's not going to be 60 questions, but uh, that's just to give you an estimate. So I'm going to say that the exam will be at least 70 minutes long. And maybe as much as, if there's 60 questions in 15 minutes, maybe 75 minutes long. Okay, thank you. Okay. And some of the questions I might have on a separate exam, meaning they're essay type questions, in which case they won't be timed. Uh, let's see if I've even got that set up. I don't think I have it set up yet, but uh, I have the multiple choice ones and those will be timed and you'll need the lockdown browser to access those. And that will be, you'll get e either, a, a, you know, a selection from A to E or true and false. And that will be timed. Like I said, there will be a few multiple choice questions, maybe as many as four and they will not be timed. You do need to finish them within 24 hours, but but uh, I'm not going to time them. Any questions? Like I said, total will be less than 60, probably around 65, give or take one question. Uh, and, and as I was saying, the, the, the chapters in orange here, you'll get at least two questions from the ones in orange. The lab safety, chapter one, chapter eight, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter seven, uh, the chapter on antibiotics, the chapter on host defenses, the host defenses two, the host defenses three, and the chapter on parasites. There will be at least two questions and there may be as many as three or four questions. Generally, there won't be four questions, but uh, I'm, there might be an exception for one of them. Um, and if there's four, there will be an easy question. All right, shall we do the review? Are there any questions before I begin? Oops, that's not it. So let's just begin on chapter one. I can tell you to start off with learn the history of biology or microbiology uh, from chapter one. You should also know the importance of microorganisms in the ecosystem and with people. Um, 
As you know about the normal microbiota, I think we just briefly discussed that. You should know what an infectious disease is versus an inherited disease. You should know what a pathogen is. Let me go through each slide. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, you should know the binomial nomenclature. You should know about that. You should know about the domains. And probably with the domains, the cell types. We already talked about the history of microbiology. You should know that topic. Oh, you should know about Antoni van Leeuwenhoek, and he was the father of uh, uh, protozoology and bacteriology. You should know that he's one of the early persons who started looking at things with a microscope and saw the first microbes, actually. Uh, what was before him? Uh, you should know about, uh, I think that's after... You should know about Louis Pasteur and that he uh, uh, disproved spontaneous generation. He did a lot of things, uh, the swan neck experiment. He did the concept of uh, 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 pasteurization. Uh, you should know about Edward Koch. I don't know if I've asked you any questions about Winogradsky, so you should know a little bit about Winogradsky. There's Louis Pasteur and pasteurization. Uh, and you should know about Cox postulates. We ran into those three times. You should know about vaccinations. We had a whole chapter, well, most of a chapter on that. You should know about Paul Ehrlich in that he discovered the first uh, chemotherapeutic drug. It was uh, Salver's son and worked against uh, uh, syphilis or uh, bacteria. You should know about Alexander Fleming discovering the first antibiotic and that penicillin was the first antibiotic. We already talked about that, the normal microbiota. And probably you should know the term emerging infectious disease. Any questions about chapter one? All right, let's move on to chapter three. Like I said, there will only be one question on chapter three. So let's see if I can figure out what it is. Well, you should know the terms of chapter three. You should know about the cell walls of bacteria and how they differ, the, differ the gram-positive and the gram-negative, and that the gram-positive cell wall allows the cell to be stained in the gram stain with crystal violet and why that's the case, and then the gram-negative, that it loses the crystal violet and then it'll stain gram-negatively. I'm pretty sure I'm not asking you anything about the metric system. You should know about the relative sizes of things. Just the relative order. I don't think I'm going to ask you anything about the microscope. I could be wrong, but... You might know about oil, and how the using oil allows the uh, uh, microscope to uh, show better clarity and magnification. Uh, you should know about staining, besides the gram stain, you should know that uh, staining, the main purpose is just to increase the contrast between a cell and its background. And I think that's it for chapter three. Any questions on chapter three? Chapter four. Uh, 
That's not chapter four. That's only part of chapter four. The eukaryote. Sorry. Well, you should know the terms of chapter four and what is an endotoxin. We already talked about gram positive and gram negative cells. Uh, I think that's it for chapter four. So the question would likely be the terms of chapter four. If you know the terms, you should do pretty well. I'm just looking through here briefly. Oh, this is when we talked about endospores for the first time. So you should know that concept. And we talk about that in a later chapter. All right, any questions about chapter four? Chapter five. Microbial metabolism. You should know the terms of chapter five. You should particularly pay attention to the photoautotrophs, the photoheterotrophs, the chemoautotrophs, the chemoheterotrophs. Hmm. And you should know about aerobic respiration. We did talk about that in great deal and how it differs from anaerobic respiration. Any questions about that? Trying to remember if I have a question about fermentation. No, that's respiration. Well, I think you should know in fermentation that you make a net of two ATP. I don't think I break it down into the different types of fermentation. All right, any questions about chapter five? Nobody's asking questions. Chapter six. Well, you should know the terms of chapter six. Once again, we're talking about uh, endospores and how they differ from reproductive spores. You should know the uh, various requirements of growth and understand the four phases of growth. Let me see if I can skip to that. There we go. Uh, the four phases of growth, you should know about the lag phase, the log phase, and the stationary phase. And then that'll be followed with the death or decline phase. Any question about that? Hmm. I don't think I asked you about any of this. You probably should know about the different ways you can measure microbial growth. A plate count, also called the viable plate count, can let you assay for viable cells. Filtration allows you to uh, assay for a solution that's very dilute. I'm not going to ask you about the most probable number. A direct microscopic count, you're doing the counts under the microscope. Turbidity, an estimate. Uh, and that's by the turbidityness of the media, and it's more turbid the more cells there are in it. And then metabolic weight and dry weight, another estimate where you can determine the number of cells by how much metabolic activity there is, meaning this is actually measuring live cells, and the dry weight by how much a sample weighs. And that's it for chapter, chapter six. Chapter six. Any questions?
Now, chapter 7, which actually we didn't do next. We did chapter 8 and chapter 13 and chapter 14 and chapter 7, but I'm just going to do it in numerical order. Study chapter 7 much better than the other chapters, other than chapter 1, because there will be at least two questions from chapter 7. Uh, I think you weren't even quizzed on chapter 7, but I have to look that up. Um, so you should know the terms of chapter 7, especially the terms of sterilization, disinfection, and to sepsis. Uh, disinfection, oh, I already have that one. Uh, germing, sanitization, and then autoclaving, which is another way of sterilizing. And then you know that pasteurization doesn't sterilize the milk, it just sort of cleans it, and uh, uh, the milk will have a shelf life because it does have microbes in it. And then know what a biocide and a germicide is. Uh, be able to discuss the factors that influence microbial death rates. There's three major ways in which antimicrobial agents kill cells or inhibit cells. Let's see if I can remember them. Uh, damage proteins and enzymes, damage the cell membrane, and then damage the DNA. Uh, know about the various types of disinfectants and briefly how they work. You don't need to know that in any great detail. We'll look at that in a moment. Oh, and then you should understand the relative resistance of the major microbial groups to antimicrobial agents. Uh, you should know, let me blow that up, uh, that to kill something, you really need, and to kill the entire population, you need to expose the agent to a disinfectant for a long enough time to kill it. And the more cells they are, the longer the exposure time you'll need. So that's something you should know. Uh, microbial death rate will happen uh, with respect to four different characters of the microbes. The number of microbes present will take longer to kill. Environmental influences can affect the microbial death rate. Uh, Generally, in the presence of organic matter, and that's not true for all disinfectants, but to some, if organic matter is around, the disinfectant will not work as well. <clears throat> like bleach, for example, is inactivated by organic matter. Uh, temperature and treatment, well, that's the treatment time. The temperature will increase the death rate. The higher the temperature, the quicker the things will die. And then the presence of biofilms will determine how quickly the uh, microbes will die. Uh, we already talked about time of exposure. And then the microbial characteristics will also affect the death rate. Uh, like mycobacterium, when you apply a common disinfectant, it's not going to be killed very readily because the mycolic acid in the mycobacteria will prevent water-soluble things from coming into the cell. Uh, other characteristics would be endospores. They are the most uh, difficult living thing on the planet to kill. And most disinfectants do not kill endospores. There are some exceptions like uh, uh, the peroxides. So those are the terms. We're not going to talk about those. Let's move on. We already mentioned you need to know the terms. You should know the physical methods for controlling microbial growth. You should know the difference between dry heat and wet heat, and which one uh, takes longer to kill, which is a dry heat, like baking. And you can put your hand in the oven and take out a pie, where you cannot put your hand through steam, for example. Uh, so, autoclaving, we already discussed that. Filtration, low temperature, high pressure, desiccation, radiation. You should know that there are two forms of radiation, ionizing radiation that creates ions, which then go in and ionize molecules, and sooner or later the DNA will be damaged, uh, which can be lethal to the cell. If you get enough damage to the DNA, it will be lethal. 
non-ionizing radiation doesn't kill that way. That's UV light. It uh, damages DNA by creating thymine dimers. And instead of the thymine binding with the hydrogen bond to the A, the thymine forms a dimer, which is actually two uh, covalent bonds between the thymine. And this really disrupts the DNA. This DNA cannot be, re um, cannot be replicated correctly. If it is replicated, mutations will be made, and it cannot transcribe this region of the DNA as well. Hmm. I talked about that. Uh, probably you should know the disk diffusion method, not really from this uh, um, this lecture, but because we went and spent a whole lab about that. So that's why you should know about the disk 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 dis diffusion method, meaning the Kirby Bayer method for antibiotics or other disinfectants and antiseptics. All right, let's move over to that. Uh, you should know the different classes of antibiotics, like uh, phenol and phenolics, and I'm not going to separate those as a class. Uh, biphenols, which are just two phenols hooked together. Uh, biguanides, chlorohexidine, um, which is used in preparation for surgery. Halogens, which are common uh, disinfectants, are that way. Iodine used on the skin, and chlorine used as a very common disinfectant. They're halogens. Uh, alcohols, uh, a real poor disinfectant, but it's actually very good at working against uh, mycobacteria, and that's because alcohols can get through the cell wall, can get through the mycolic acid. Um, alcohol doesn't kill endospores at all, and it's not very good with non-enveloped viruses, but it's actually very good with enveloped viruses and, and gram-negative cells, because the gram-negative uh, outer membrane is uh, susceptible to the viruses. And the alcohol can work on proteins, denaturing the proteins, so it can work on non-enveloped viruses just not well and uh, it can work on gram positive cells as well but like i said it's not a strong disinfectant uh, heavy metals you should know heavy metals is a antibacterial do you use that term as a disinfectant no more used as an antiseptic which its use is coming back You'll put uh, heavy metal like silver in uh, a Band-Aid or dressing in the hospital. Uh, you should know that soaps and disinfectants and acid anionic detergents or surface active agents or surfactants. Uh, I don't think I'm going to ask you about chemical food pres preservatives. It's sort of like an antibiotic for food. Um, so I'm not going to ask you about that. I will ask you about antibiotics for people, but not for food. Uh, aldehydes, another class of uh, disinfectant. Gaseous uh, disinfectants, which can be used to sterilize a closed chamber, meaning that these are very toxic. Um, the thing is, they're very toxic to people, too, so the use has to be highly controlled. And they do kill. This is another one which can kill endospores. But the exposure to endospores, that's not just a few minutes. You have to subject the endospores to the gas, the gaseous agent like ethylene oxide for a long term. We're talking about hours. And so for uh, a quick sterilization, it wouldn't work. But it is good in the sense that, uh, you know, sterilizing something that's large and difficult to sterilize, like a mattress or medical supplies or, uh, I don't know, like surgical instruments that they don't want corroded and they don't want to autoclave it. And then peroxygens, this is uh, one of the few, like uh, ozone and hydrogen peroxide, 
one of the few that can kill Indospores. It's a gaseous agent. And I don't think I'm going to ask you a question about the effectiveness of the different agents. But like I said, you should know a little bit about this side and that prions are really difficult to kill or remove. And that's just the nature of the protein. Um, let's see if I can blow this up. Uh, endospore is generally the second most difficult thing to treat. Uh, mycobacteria, the next most difficult thing to treat. But an exception with this one is that ethanol, which doesn't do anything to these two, is very effective at killing mycobacteria because the ethanol can go through the cell wall of the mycobacteria. And then cysts of protozoa, difficult to kill. Uh, vegetative protozoa, gram-negative bacteria, fungi, viruses, gram-positive. And then viruses with lipid envelopes are, generally speaking, the most uh, easy to kill, or that's the right term with a virus, um, just because the lipid is susceptible to acting. I will point out that coronavirus is a virus with a lipid envelope. So according to this one, coronavirus is, in theory, easy to kill. And generally speaking, soap and alcohol, which are not very good disinfectants, uh, will kill coronavirus because it has a lipid envelope. You just need to wash your hands long enough to make sure you get everywhere. You, you wash your hands with soap for 20 minutes to make sure you kill the COVID-19. Any question about any of that? All right. I think that's it. Let me see. Yeah, that's it for this chapter. Uh, we did talk briefly about prions here and in one other place. And like I said, you should know that these are really difficult to kill. What they did with the dead cows in England was they incinerated them. And you need about a thousand degrees Fahrenheit to destroy the prion. Okay. Uh, now, um, uh, they've discovered that for like surgical equipment, if they're working on a patient who might be a prion infected patient, they can use proteases. That proteinase seems to destroy the prions. And so that's an experimental treatment, but is one that will work for things like surgical instruments. I mean, prions are really difficult to kill, but they are susceptible to proteases and protein aces. All right, any questions? If not, that's it for chapter seven. Let's move on to chapter eight. This is the genetics of microorganisms. And there will be about two questions from genetics. You should know the terms. You should know, I guess it, lateral gene transfer in particular, the three types. Let's see if I can remember them from the top of my head. Um, sexual trans, I mean transformation, where DNA goes out of a dead cell and then is in the environment and comes into a new cell and can transform the cell. Sexual conjugation, where an F plus cell skewers an F minus cell and then transfers a plasmid into the F minus cell. And that F minus cell, when it gets the plasmid, it will make a, a sex pili. And so it becomes uh, an F plus cell. And then uh, transduction, where a virus, instead of picking up the viral genome, picks up a piece of the host cell's DNA, and then that virus will inject that into another host cell. And that host cell that's infected with that virus actually gets a piece of DNA from a bacteria cell. And so it can incorporate that DNA into its chromosome. And then uh, in all three of these ways, a cell can pick up new, new genetic material, it's material that is existing in the world, okay, 
but it can be spread around by lateral gene transfer. Any question about that? So you should know the terms. You should know what replication is, transcription and translation, and understand the different types of mutation. Let me go through and see if there's anything else I want to talk about. Just the terms. said you should know the different types of mutation, spontaneous mutation, and then the other is by a, a chemical or physical mutation. And then you should know the types of mutation, a, 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 a base substitution, a frame shift mutation, and a macro mutation. And with base substitution you can have a silent mutation, a missense mutation, and a nonsense mutation. There we go, transformation, yeah, conjugation, and transduction. All right, any questions about chapter eight? Let's move on to chapter 13. Uh, viruses, viroids, and prions. Well, you should know the terms of viruses and with the, uh, well, you should understand the characteristic construction and classification of viruses, understand about viral multiplication, and then lastly, understand about prions and viroids. Now, with the bacteriophages, you should understand that they have two ways to reproduce. There can be a, a lytic life cycle where the virus infects a cell, replicates, and then lyses the cell. Or the uh, virus can enter the lysogenic life cycle. And remember, a virus which is a lysogenic bacteriophage, let me see if I can find that. Nope, I'm past it. That's it there. A lysogenic virus, once it infects a cell, it has to decide immediately, does it enter the lytic life cycle or does it enter the lysinogenic life cycle? And if it enters the lytic life cycle, it just replicates the virus, lyses the cell, and then that releases the new virions, which go out and infect another cell. If it enters the lysinogenic life cycle, the DNA of the virus will integrate into the chromosome of the host cell, forming a prophase. And the only time the viral DNA is replicated is when the cell replicates. All right? And then for unknown reasons, or uh, reasons which are not well understood, the virus can come out of the lysogenic life cycle and enter the lytic life cycle. And when it does that, the prophage comes out of the chromosome. The term is excises from the chromosome and then the virus enters the lytic life cycle. All right, any question about any of that? Uh, there are some consequences of lysogeny. The lysogenic host cell cannot be infected with a virus of that species because it has the virus of that species uh, as a lysogenic component as part of the, the chromosome of the host. Uh, and then this DNA from the virus can give this host cell new properties, meaning a new gene. And the best example of that is that uh, Crinibacteria diphtherium only expresses the Crinibacterium diphtheria endotoxin when the bacteria is infected with an lysogenic virus meaning the viral DNA encodes the Crinibacteria diphtherium endotoxin. 
any question about that. All right, we should know that animal viruses differ in a number of ways. The main difference, there are a few differences, like obviously the, the way they get into the cell differs because animal cells don't have a cell wall they need to get through. And the main other difference is, is that uh, animal viruses can replicate in the cytoplasm, and most of the RNA viruses do that, they replicate in the cytoplasm, the exception being the reverse transcriptase virus, um, family of viruses. And then the DNA viruses generally replicate in the nucleus of animal cells. Any question about that? I think I'm asking anything about DNA viruses. Uh, you should know that uh, how the DNA replicates and be transcribed to make protein. And with the RNA, uh, the positive strand RNA can be read to make the protein, translated into the protein. But the negative strand has to make a positive strand to be translated into protein. And then that positive strand can be used as a template for making more copies of the negative strand RNA genome of the virus. And the same with the positive strand. When it wants to replicate, it makes a negative strand and then uses that as a template to replicate its RNA genome. All right, let's see if there's anything else. You should know that retroviruses are different because they have the enzyme reverse transcriptase, and there's both a protein in the virus of reverse transcriptase, as well as the genome of the virus encodes the gene for reverse transcriptase. And reverse transcriptase is an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase meaning it can take single-strand RNA and make double-strand DNA from that RNA template. And when the DNA is made, it'll then go into the cytoplasm or the, uh, the nucleoplasm, sorry, the nucleus of the cell. And so this retroviruses actually replicate from their DNA copy, which is in the nucleus, and that means retroviruses are an exception. This is an RNA virus that replicates in the nucleus. All right, any question about that? Uh, you should know about coronaviruses, and the main reason to know about coronaviruses is COVID-19 is a coronavirus. Uh, generally, coronaviruses in humans just cause colds. There are some exceptions, COVID-19, SARS, which was actually a little more lethal than COVID-19, but didn't spread as easily as COVID-19. And then MERS, which is even more lethal than COVID-19, but MERS doesn't spread among humans. Uh, you should know that COVID-19 is closely related to bat coronaviruses, and actually they think is a recombination of two bat coronaviruses and a pangolin virus, COVID coronavirus, and the pangolin is only a little bit of the genome, uh, including the spikes for the coronavirus. Uh, transmission mostly from droplets and coughs and sneezes within a range of six feet, although it can be breathed out of a person, why you shouldn't be within six feet. Um, and in particularly, when people are singing, COVID-19 can come out. It can be breathed or coughed on surfaces and then picked up, and on plastic or metal surfaces, it can survive for three days, one day on cardboard or paper. Symptoms generally similar to the flu, except that obviously there's, there's uh, death. Of course, that can't happen with the flu, but it's very rare. 
Um, all right, you should know that viruses can cause some human cancers. 10 to 15 percent of all human cancers are started by a virus, and it seems to be more prevalent in certain cancers than other cancers. And I'm not going to ask you a question about that. Uh, two ways that viruses can cause cancer. Um, if the virus DNA integrates into the host cell's DNA, when it integrates into the DNA, it can mutate that DNA, and that can give rise to cancer. And then the second way viruses can cause cancer, some viruses have oncogenes, and an oncogene is a mutated cellular growth gene. And so when an oncogene is inserted into a cell, the cell just keeps on growing as if it's a cancer. And so uh, the oncogene just gives the cell the ability to grow without control. And that would be a cancer. All right, any question about that? Uh, another life cycle that animal viruses have, we didn't mention that, but they have the lytic life cycle. They can also be the budding life cycle. And animal viruses, that's how they obtain their envelope. And uh, with the budding life cycle viruses, some of them can go into latency. And the virus, when it's latent, it's effectively not active. It's not reproducing. It's not causing disease. The best example of a latent virus is chickenpox. When the child has symptoms of chickenpox, the virus is replicating. And then the virus can leave the budding life cycle and enter latency. And it's just sitting out. And for chickenpox, that virus can be sitting out for decades, not just years, but actually decades. And then come out later and it won't have the symptoms of chickenpox. That's only the first time. It'll have every other time the virus is active, it'll have the symptom of shingles. Okay? And that's when the virus comes out of latency. Another example of a virus that goes through latency is a virus that causes cold sores. Uh, persistent viral infection is a uh, animal virus similar to a budding life cycle except the virus doesn't bud and the virus is just shed by the cells from uh, what do you call that uh, um, exocytosis and initially the persistent virus the viral load is low but over time the virus persists and uh, the disease just gets worse and worse for the persistent virus and sometimes it can be fatal. Uh, some persistent viruses are tolerated, like cytomegalovirus. Uh, the persistent infection will be tolerated by the patient. And about 50% of Americans have a cytomegalovirus infection. It's generally managed by the host. It will be persistent. The exception would be an AIDS patient, cytomegalovirus is not managed and will be a problem. Okay, any questions about that? I figured out what this is for varicella zoster, the chicken pox. There are some people, it's really rare, like less than one in a thousand, where the patient in with a persistent uh, viral infection, meaning the patient always has shingles. And it's very rare, but like I said, maybe in one in a thousand or one, less than one in a thousand patients, when they get shingles, they always have shingles. They have a persistent viral infection. So that's what this is about. This is not a normal varicella zoster, meaning where the child gets chicken pox and later in life the child gets, which is no longer a child, gets uh, shingles and then it usually goes away. That's not a persistent infection. This is one where the patient is continuously having shingles. And it's very rare. Uh, my mother actually had it, and I went and looked it up, and 
She had the shingles for three years before she died, and the shingles didn't kill her. But uh, the point is that there are some patients who have a persistent shingles. Okay. Any question about any of that? Uh, a persistent viral infection, like I said, starts low and builds up over time. And many times if the patient dies, the virus blooms and then the patient dies while the, the, uh, the uh, thing ends here. Uh, that's not always the case. Sometimes the, the viral load will plateau and then the patient just tolerates it. Uh, acute viral infection, that's something like a cold. It happens very rapidly. You're releasing a lot of viruses, and then the, the viral infection goes away. Uh, latent infection is where you have an acute infection with chickenpox, and then later in life, you have the latent infection where the virus comes out of latency and it will enter the budding life cycle. You should know about prions and viroids. I already talked about that. All right, any questions about chapter 13? If not, let's move on to chapter 14. I'm trying to spend a little more time on these chapters because we will have several questions, at least two, from them. Chapter 14, Principles of Disease and Epidemiology. You should really know the terms of this chapter because about half of this chapter is knowing the terms. You should know, understand the relationship between the normal microbiota and its host. Understand the stages of disease development. I'll talk about that. And understand about nosocomial infections, which are also called hospital-acquired infections. All right, any question about any of that? You should know the terms. You should know about normal microbiota and where you can find them. And you might remember, although I'm not sure I asked a question about that, but you have more cells in your normal microbiota than you have human cells. Okay, so you should know that. I don't think I'm asking you any questions about what's a weird place you find the normal microbiota. <clears throat> <clears throat> you should know about microbial antagonism and that the normal microbiota can be antagonistic with some microbes that are pathogens and could, if there wasn't a normal microbiota, get established on the person and cause disease, but because we have a normal microbiota, they compete with the human pathogen and don't allow the human pathogen to get established can just occupy the niche or occupy the resources like the food. It can make like the skin, the vagina, the urethra, I think. No, not really. The skin more acidic. Um, so the normal microbiota can help make the environment more acidic. Uh, and then the normal microbiota can produce bacteriocin, which are proteins that act very specifically on cells similar to the cell that made the bacteria sin. And these proteins have properties of an antibiotic. Any question about that? Excuse me. I'm about to sneeze, so I wanted to blow my nose. Uh, the normal microbiota forms a symbiotic relationship with us. And our normal microbiota can take a mutualism symbiosis or a commensalism. Mutualism is with where both organisms benefit. We provide a home for this species of the normal microbiota. And then it benefits us in some way. Like the E. coli helping you to digest food. Some of your normal microbiota in your intestines can give you vitamins like vitamin K. Okay, and then there's other normal microbiota where it benefits from us. We give it a home, we may give it nutrients, and then it's neutral to us. It doesn't harm us, doesn't help us. 
Uh, I had heard that one, I can think of one exact species of this, that each of us has a nematode in our eye, and it's a, forming a commensalistic relationship. I'm not sure what it is eating, but it's not eating anything of us, and it, so it's not damaging us, but it gets a home from us. And so that's a commensalistic relationship. And I can't think of any bacteria that are commensalist because all of them that I can think of on your skin or in your gut, they're doing something for us. Like the Staphylococcus epidermidis and the Micrococcus luteus on our skin. At the very least, because they're on our skin, they help make the skin more acidic and then they can compete with the pathogen. So I would say those are more of a mutualist. They're not a true commensalist, meaning we're benefit, benefiting by having those on our skin. Uh, normally, the normal microbiota does not form a parasitic relationship where it can cause disease. Some people do have Staphylococcus aureus on their skin, and that can cause skin disease. And so if you have Staphylococcus aureus, that would be a parasite. And the, the relationship with that normal microbiota is parasitic. And that is what the human pathogens follow, the parasitic relationship. All right, any question about that? The normal microbiota generally doesn't cause disease, but they can cause disease under certain circumstances like when they're growing in a place where they shouldn't be, or they're causing disease and an immunocompromised patient, and that we call an opportunistic microorganism. You should know about Cox postulates. This is where we talk about it a second time. I just said you should know the terms. Maybe you should know about a reservoir. It has to exist before uh, a patient can get infected, meaning the disease has to come from someplace. And we call that the disease causing organism has to come from someplace. And we call that a reservoir. Uh, development of disease. You should know the different periods that disease goes through. Uh, the first period, incubation period, the second period, prodromal period, the third period, period of illness, and that's generally when the patient is most sick and has the most uh, infective agents, and then that's period followed by the period of decline where the patient starts feeling better, and then the period of convalescence. And you should know that if a patient is communicable during all of these periods of disease. Okay. All right. We talked about reservoirs. You should know about the transmission of disease. Oh, nosocomial infection. There will definitely be at least one question about nosocomial infection, also called hospital acquired infection. We come about because of three things there's microorganisms in the hospital or the health care facility. The patients are in that facility for a reason, and so they're an immunocompromised host. And then there's a train of transmission where people or patients uh, get exposed to the disease. It could be from another patient. It could be because the staff in the hospital uh, was not being careful and did not wash their hands or their medical equipment between patients, or it could be spread by uh, um, visitors to the hospital. And uh, for those of you who are wondering, uh, nosocomial infections, America has gotten better at holding the number down. It's no longer about 10% of patients. I'm not going to ask you a question about this. I'm just telling you for your information. It used to be about 10% of all hospital patients acquired a nosocomial infection. That number now is lower, although I'm not sure with COVID-19. I'm sure that's brought it up a little bit. 
but the number is lower and it's closer to about 1 in 25 patients. So what would that be? Maybe 4 or 5 percent and that's much better. So hospitals have realized that nosocomial infections are a problem and they've taken steps to reduce them and it successfully reduced less than 10 percent. I'm just telling you there's a little bit of hope and you don't need to know that for the final. I'm not going to ask you about that. We already talked about that. A control of nosocomial procedures you need to when you go out and get a job. Control nosocomial infections. Use aseptic technique. You've learned it in the lab. Always use it in the hospital. Properly handle contaminated materials. The pathogen should stay in the contaminated material. It should never come out. Uh, use frequent and thorough hand washing. That reduces nosocomial infections by at least 50%. And then educate the staff, the patients, and the visitors that nosocomial infections are a problem and we need to take steps to reduce their number. All right? Any question about that? All right, you should know about the, the epidemiology and generally speaking for U.S. reportable diseases. They're sent to uh, usually the, the uh, county health facility, which sends it to the state, which sends it to the Center for Disease Control. And the Trump administration recently changed that. COVID-19 is now lo no longer being sent to the Center for Disease Control. And I think it's being sent to the NIH or National Institute of Health, something like that. And when I read about that, I said, geez, why are they doing that? But uh, I'm not going to go into that. So come on, the last slide. Yeah, you should just know the terms of epidemiology. All right, any questions about Chapter 14? No questions? Let's move on. Is that the last one? Yes. I don't think I specifically asked you any question about classification other than a question about the domains. Um, oops, let's come on up here. Let's talk about antibiotics. Where's my lesson? I'll just use the lecture, long notes. Uh, you should know what selective toxicity is and its importance to developing antibiotics. Uh, you should know that we made a large number of penicillins because once they made one penicillin, like penicillin G, and then made it available, the microorganisms started becoming resistant to that. And so then they made another penicillin, like ampicillin, and then the microorganisms started developing resistant to that. And then I don't remember what the next one was after that. It might have been methicillin and then carboxicillin. So the microorganisms, once a, pen, a, a family of antibiotic is made, the microorganisms will eventually evolve resistance to it. Okay? Any question about any of that? And if the microorganism evolves resistance and this doesn't lose like resistance to penicillin G, we're then stuck because the microorganism could evolve resistance to all antibiotics. And then they have to use experimental therapies for treating the patient. And we're not going to talk about the experimental therapies. Any question about any of that? And then understand the mechanisms of action of a different variety of drugs meaning the drugs work in different ways, and we call that the mode of action. Uh, relate the mechanism of action to the spectrum of activity of the antibiotic, meaning you should know that some antibiotics are narrow spectrum. They only act narrowly on certain microorganisms, like penicillin G only works on gram-positive bacteria, but there are other antibiotics which have a 
broad spectrum of action. And ampicillin and carboxacillin work on both gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria. So they are broad spectrum. All right, you should know that selective toxicity is possible for the U bacteria, the bacteria, sorry, uh, because there are differences between the bacteria and eukaryotic cells, and the drug is taking advantage of those differences. Any question about that? So some of the drugs that work on protein translation, they're working on the fact that there's differences in the ribosomes, um, differences in protein translation, and so it harms the bacteria, but not the eukaryotes. Uh, penicillin, no, polymyxin B is taking uh, account of the fact that there's differences in the uh, cells of bacteria, which works on gram-negative cells, which have a uh, outer membrane, and our cells don't have an outer membrane, so uh, uh, polymyxin B works on gram-negative bacteria, but not on eukaryotic cells, all right? Allowing selective toxicity, where the drug is selectively toxic to the bacteria, and then is not toxic to eukaryotic cells. Now that doesn't mean that it doesn't have any selective toxicity because generally whenever we take any antibiotic, it does disrupt our normal microbiota. And that is a part of you. And when that gets disrupted, it can cause symptoms or signs for the patient. Okay, like something that frequently happens. Well, actually there's three things that frequently happen when patient takes uh, antibiotics orally, and that is they can become constipated because the normal bacteria of the gut is disrupted, or the patient can get diarrhea, which is the same thing, the normal bacteria in the gut are hit by the antibiotic, or you can get a, uh, a bacteria, not a bacterial infection, a uh, yeast infection, and the reason is that the normal microbiota are suppressed by the antibiotic and then the yeast are no, no longer competing with the normal bacteria and so the yeast can then bloom and cause the yeast infection. All right, any question about any of that? So you should know that the antibiotics have different uh, actions, mode of actions. There are some that inhibit protein synthesis or translation. There's some that disrupt the cytoplasmic membrane. Let me go ahead and show you that picture while I'm talking about this. Um, uh, so uh, tetracycline, chloramphenicol, uh, the macroglides can do that, uh, inhibit protein uh, synthesis. Uh, polymyxin is the only one, polymyxin B, the only one that disrupts the cytoplasmic membrane. And what that does is it puts a hole in the outer membrane of the, the gram-negative cell. There are bacteria, I mean antibiotics, which inhibit a metabolic pathway of bacteria. And the two drugs we talked about were trimethylpram and then the sulfa drugs like sulfonamide. There are drugs that inhibit DNA synthesis or RNA synthesis, and the nucleotide analogs do that in the quinolones. Uh, rifampin, if I'm remembering correctly, inhibits RNA synthesis. Uh, we didn't talk much about, there are drugs that can inhibit the pathogens attached to or recognition of a host cell. Uh, we didn't talk about those because generally they're not used as an antibiotic because they don't provide 100% protection. So generally these antibiotics are not used if there's another antibiotic that can be used. Uh, with viral, antiviral drugs, we do use these because they reduce 
the viruses infecting our cells and reduce the viral burden. But like I said, they're not 100% effective. And if you don't stop 100% of the viruses infecting you, you're going to get the viral infection. It's just that it won't be as bad as it could be without the antiviral drugs. And they're developing these for COVID-19. I'm just mentioning it as a side. Uh, that inhibits the viruses binding to our cells. Prevents the virus from binding to our cells. And then the last one is the one we spent the most time on. The uh, uh, antibiotics that inhibit the cell wall synthesis. And we sp specifically talked about that's the way penicillin G acts in all members of the penicillin family, as well as the cephalosporins, vancomycin, and basotracin. We mentioned all of those. They uh, inhibit, inhibit the uh, cell wall synthesis. Penicillin G, we'll talk just a little bit more about that. How it acts is, is that it gets into a cell While the cell is making its cell wall, yeah, there it is. Let's see if I can blow that up. And uh, where the crosslinks are in uh, the peptidoglycan, the uh, beta-lactam ring blocks where the crosslinks would normally form. And so that stops the cell wall from forming and then there will be a hole in the cell wall and the cytoplasm can protrude out of that hole and uh, eventually as more water comes into the cell the cytoplasm will burst and then the uh, uh, cell will die because the uh, cytoplasm will leak out of the cell. All right any question about that? That is how penicillin G works and actually how all the members of the penicillin family work. Uh, you should know that when considering which drug to use, that the clinician has to think about the spectrum of action of the drug. If they know what is causing the disease, they generally want to use a narrow spectrum drug. But if they don't know which species is causing the disease, then they want to use a broad spectrum antibiotic so that they can make sure that they get the species which is causing the disease. They have to decide on the administrator route, and patients generally prefer, prefer a topical treatment or an oral treatment. It was kind of uh, humorous. I looked up all your answers on the worksheet, and some of you didn't like having a shot, and some of you didn't like having an enema. And so generally, either the shot or the enema were the ones that students didn't like, and I've seen that before. No one objects to taking a pill okay or a topical treatment but you do have to consider the ease of the administrative route uh, the side effects the patient the clinician has to decide what the side effects are and they want an antibiotic which is safe and has minimal disruption of the normal microflora and of course you're going to disrupt the normal microflora but you want as minimal for that as you can and then the clinician has to decide on a drug that, uh, deciding on the drug has to figure out how long the drug will be staying in the person's system. And usually what they do for that, if you're taking the drug orally, they'll tell you to take the, the drug every so many hours. And that's because the drug is only in the person's system for a certain length of time. I think that's pretty much it for this chapter. Okay, any questions about chapter six? I mean, lesson six, antimicrobial drugs. All right, let's talk about host defenses. Why aren't I seeing that?
Hmm. I must have uh, put that somewhere else. All right, let's find it. I know where it is in another location. Nope. Uh, probably what I did was I accidentally put those into the, an inappropriate uh, folder. All right, host defense is one. It's past 2.15. I'm sorry? Oh, it's 2.15. All right, let's continue this at uh, 2.30. Uh, we probably will need to spend another half hour. All right?